One more second, one more second. I'm always afraid I'm gonna hit that leave meeting when it, when it comes up and says it's recording, which would be bad if I, I left my own meeting. And uh, Mr. Long, you are good to go. All right, thank you, Seth. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'd like to call the October 18th, 2021 Citrus School Community Meeting to order. Um, response to Governor Baker's declaration of a public health emergency and the related emergency executive order dated March 12th, 2020. Town of Citrus public meetings can still meet remotely and still further notice. Uh, this meeting will be recorded and will be posted following the meeting. Public comment will be available through the Zoom and communi community members can reach out to me at mlong at sit.org uh, with any questions or comments. Um, so I take a roll call vote to begin the meeting. Um, Long, yes. Lindblom? Yes. Gates? Yes. Uh, Borkowski? Yes. And Brendan. Yes. Thank you all. Uh, so we'll dive right into the meeting. So the first item on the agenda is celebrating student learning uh, with the math mathematics department and Chair Liz Grindle. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. All right. I am, I believe I have ability to share my screen, so I'll uh, do you, that you, and you, see. What you have the ability, Miss Grindle. <laughs> all right. Perfect. Can you see that okay? We do not see it right now. Okay, see, this is a great check. <laughs> we see it, we, there we go. We see your Zoom screen right now. Perfect, all right, let me just get to that. Perfect, great. I think that should be a full screen of the presentation. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks for inviting me. I'm excited to celebrate all the great things that are happening in the math department grades six through 12. Um, one of the most important things that we think about when we're working with our kids are relationships, problem solving, independent thinking and collaborators. And um, those are some of those big picture pieces that we find that are super helpful in helping kids access math, become those independent learners we want them to, as well as problem solvers. So we're gonna dive right into creating the balance between these four pieces. Um, these are just two examples of some of the um, opportunities we've given kids um, early this year and the end of last year, where students create and craft a piece of a project that these activities are giving them opportunities to access math. So they're getting rid of the barriers for students, um, building community in the classroom with the adults and their peers. Um, in the behind the mask activity that you see on the right side, all of the students had to identify um, parts of who they are as a character um, that bring what they bring to the table. So you can kind of make out some of the words they use to describe themselves, um, happy, funny, kind, hardworking. Um, these are displayed in the halls of gates. And on the left side, the project is um, displayed in one of the high school classrooms after a community building piece. So again, um, these are, they lead into our higher rigorous activities, um, but creating the community is super important for our, our teachers and our students. Um, then we get into our problem solving. So um, the left picture might look familiar if um, you'd read any of the Thursday thoughts, but we find that this, um, this opportunity for kids to engage in the math practices and using transferable skills in their lives is super important. Um, on the left, it's kids accessing science and math at the same time, along with um, celebrating the equinox. Um, the photo on the right is a picture of our high school students in our AP stats class. Um, they're using these cards for a simulation and it directly relates to a question that's on the AP exam. So it gives the kids the opportunity to actually see what this looks like when they're trying to figure out a probability or um, are counting cards essentially is what we might call it um, as it could apply to um, the exam. Um, when we keep exposing our kids to these opportunities, um, they're able to see themselves as mathematicians, engineers, and builders of the world. And they're more likely to take part in some of our higher level math classes once they have the opportunity. 
Um, and then independent thinking is important for all of our students. And whether that's um, in a gamified setting, like in the left in a, a, a middle school classroom where they're, ex where they're playing Jeopardy independently, um, or in the middle picture where students are independently creating a cube and having to make sense of its volume and its area. Um, and that was an independent activity. And I actually remember taking the picture of the, the students here. And I, when I had a conversation with one of the young man in the middle, he's like, why can't I do this with someone else? And we had this conversation about like, it's a little bit of a stretch for you to figure it out on your own. And then we can always check with each other. So we want our kids to productively struggle, um, which is different than saying like, figure it out on your own, um, because we know that's where the cusp of learning is gonna happen and their mistakes and growing from those experiences. And then lastly, um, just two examples of some collaboration happening. Um, on the left, it's a portion of the entire class thinking about inductive and deductive reasoning um, uh, as they're, they're working together collaboratively. And then on the right side, again, another opportunity in our AP stats class where they're doing a simulation that again, for both of these, these lead into when they're um, taking an assessment um, on their own, and whether that's an assessment that's created for us, for the kids inside the school or something like say an MCAS or an AP test where kids um, have the opportunity to show what they know on their own. Um, both the content and the skills in these collaborative activities definitely transfer to those independent assessments um, that they're gonna take during their educational journey. Um, just a few numbers, cause we can't not talk about the numbers here. Um, all of our students grades six through 12 are enrolled in at least one math class. It's, an, um, it's a requirement for kids for high school graduation. So 100% of our kids grades six through 12 are enrolled. Um, what's an interesting number, and we really should celebrate this, is that when kids get to the high school and they can start picking classes to enhance for electives, 10% of our kids, which is just over actually 90 kids this school year, are enrolled or two or more math classes. That means they're making a choice um, and there's room for them to take another math class on top of the class that they're normally taking. Um, we see this as a, like a really neat opportunity for kids and it's great that kids are interested in accessing more of those. And then some, um, some more recent numbers, 43% um, of our students from a self-reported survey from GLAD, the class of 2021, have reported that they are going, are planning on pursuing a major in post-secondary, and these were um, students who were attending college, 43% of them in a math-related field. Um, and just, I put an asterisk there because they wanna be like clear about math-related as we define it here. Um, Math-related in this case would be business, accounting, engineering, computer science, math specifically, or data science. So those are some great numbers. And I think that the 43% the of kids self-reporting that directly relates to 10% of our kids getting the opportunity to take another class along with when it maybe doesn't fit in their schedule for a second course and they're choosing another math course. They don't need a second course to meet with those demands of choosing that major, but it does really give them that opportunity. So um, that's all I wanted. That's not, I did want to celebrate more, but I figured um, <laughs> that that would be a nice touch as we start off the school year of us sharing um, what we really believe that if we build those relationships, encourage problem solving, independent thinking, collaborating, that we really will get students who see themselves as mathematicians, engineers, and builders of the world. Um, I really appreciate your time. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thanks. So we'll turn it over to the rest of the committee. Are there any questions for uh, Ms. Grindle? Okay, I just had one, um, and I hope that I were I, I asked this correctly. So you know, you mentioned a couple times that your the kids are answering questions that, that specifically came up in MCAS for standardized tests. What, um, you know, obviously that's been something that's come up in the last couple of school committee meetings. How, I mean, is that built into the the normal state framework where you know these are questions that should be asked and the, you know the state kind of pushes hey maybe you should do this to help the kids prepare for some of the standardized tests they have to take or is it um you know is that is that something that we're doing on our own just to help the kids um be prepared yeah i thank you that's a great question so um one of the strategies that we use like whether we're talking about an ap test or an mcas test we have i'm going to say hundreds but we have tests questions that are like recently released say so for example we have 
um, when the state chooses to, they release a certain amount of test questions. And so they'll say like, these are the release test questions. Um, the most recent one, depending upon the grade level, we either get about half the questions to three quarters of the questions. Um, so we use those as practice questions because they're totally aligned to the standards. So to answer your question, um, does the state tell us to? No, but we know those are resources that will help us. And that's the same piece with our AP tests. They release almost like right after they give the test, they'll release test questions. And so we use those to feed us forward. So they're part of kids, you know, sometimes they're a do now or sometimes there's this weekly warm up, and we really do our best to make it, you know, test like, if you will, but also it shouldn't be laborious, right? It should be like something kids are like, oh, I'm excited to like practice this or practice these tools. So it's a positive piece about getting ready for an assessment and it's not a chore and it feels connected to what we're learning because we don't want it to be standalone. So because we're teaching the standards, the frameworks, we find that kids aren't like, wait, what are we doing? I've never seen this before. Right. No, and that makes perfect sense. And I appreciate that answer. And I guess the follow-up I have is, and you know, strictly from a math perspective, do you know how what percent of like questions that kids get asked either in homework or on tests is coming from that versus based on the math uh, curriculum that we have in place? So I don't actually, I don't know that I could answer that specifically, but I would say to you that all the standards, so I'll give you an example, like our sixth graders take the sixth grade MCAS, seventh grade, seventh, eighth, eighth, and then 10th grade would take that 10th grade MCAS. We know our students sitting in 10th grade, like what standards are assessed on the MCAS test. So I would say to you, um, we're, we're delivering those same frameworks, whether it's the exact question or we've, as, as teachers, created a question that is standards aligned. Um, so I wouldn't say they're like the exact math MCAS question, right? Because there is also like a finite amount that we can actually take from them, even though there's hundreds. Right. Um, but I would say, I mean, if I, if I don't want to, I don't want to be get like quoted, like every single assignment has, I mean, kids are seeing, right. and we do try to say like, Hey, this looks just like a question you might see on MCAS. And I will say, um, not to like dive into just talking about MCAS, but even if we're talking about APs, questions are answered or questions are presented to kids in several ways, whether it's multiple choice, a short answer response, or those open response questions. So we're continually trying to help kids, you know, answer a question that's open response. So they have to be able to talk about, explain, show your work. What are the access points to those as opposed to, unfortunately on some of these, on these standardized tests, there's a place where none of their work gets checked on a multiple choice. So how do we help them be able to do those when no one's asking to check their work? So those are the things we're helping kids learn. Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a perfect answer. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to just put you on the spot. No, <laughs> after no, doing no. The presentation. Um, but you, you know, the way, the way you put it, like, you know, this is how we, we get kids ready. Here's the type of questions. Here's what you could see. I mean, obviously we don't want to just take every MCAS question and be like, okay, here's your test for this week. It's, you know, getting kids prepared to see the questions in a different way and, and just be prepared to know that that was perfect. And I appreciate your answer. And please, I, I just didn't want to be like, you know, 5% of every homework. Oh yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I, sorry, I meant to say rough estimate. If you said somewhere between like zero and 50, that would have worked. Mike, could I ask a follow up to your question as well? Sure. Um, so I understand what you're saying uh, about giving the kids a sample questions and things. So I guess my question is tied to my kids are in fifth and seventh, my older two right now. So that's kind of the world I live in, in terms of how I can see what they're doing in math. So I see that it's very kind of, um, there's a lot of use of IXL and Zern and those sorts of things. And there's not a lot of show your work with that. So do you feel like those apps that are, I feel like we've really, we're heavy on that currently. Is that an accurate assessment of, from a parent view of where the math is in those middle grades? And how do you think that affects down the line, 10th grade when they're testing and they need to do more of that short answer response kind of stuff. So I, I appreciate the perspective too, because that's like that, like what you're seeing, right? And I do think, um, I can't speak to fifth grade specifically. I do know the user, but I think, I, I feel like I can speak very confidently with seventh grade. I, I would, I'd love to see 
like I know what they're doing in the classroom. And when I walk into a seventh grade classroom, they're not staring at their computers doing IXL. So their notebook has the problems they're doing, the work they're doing out. So I, and so I would really, them, and I appreciate that's totally, it might be what you're seeing when they come home with that homework. So I think I would say to ask, and in this case, and I know you're not using your lens, right? Like I would say, I would, I would say to any parent, like, Hey, ask your kid what they're doing in class, ask them to show them what's going on in their notebook, ask them to see, show that routine of what it feels like to take notes and process through showing work. Because I think one of those things that we are recognizing, right? Like the reality is last year and for the past 18 months, one of the things we have missed the most, and I keep saying this to my students who are sitting in front of me, like you didn't get to be a mathematician by showing your work on paper because things were just different. So here we are challenging you and helping you get those routines. So I appreciate that, Nicole. It's like a really, it's like, that's a, that's a real piece that we might be seeing. And we're really trying as the educators to get them to show their work, show their thinking. Um, even so much as like with IXL, right? They don't have to show their work, but we're getting, we're changing some of our practices with IXL in saying like, you have to show at least three of the problems with the work done out so that if we're checking work through each other, we can A, either find our mistakes or celebrate our successes. I have a, I have a question too, Mike. Uh, hi Liz, thank you for the presentation. Um, I just have a question, I guess. Oftentimes we hear about, you know, uh, references to, to curriculum or changes in state standards. Um, could you identify what might change uh, relative to math uh, on, a stand, on a state standard and how we might implement that? Um, I appreciate your question. Um, just, for, just for a little bit of background for anybody who doesn't know, and I apologize if I'm repeating, um, the most recent updates to the math standards were in 2017. And prior to that, we're 2011. I will say to you, if we had to do like an apples to apples comparison, um, the rigor of the standards changed, the language in them changed a bit, but I would say to you to answer your question, I do not foresee the state making any major changes to the standards in the near future. I've heard none of that. I feel like I'm pretty in tune to um, what the state's looking at, where they're going. Um, if anything, I think there would be a heaviness in the math practices, which have always been part of the frameworks, but I think there is less, um, less, um, I'm losing, forgetting the word, less um, demand from um, educators or schools to be paying attention to those. Mm -hmm. So that would be my, my um, guess. But again, I, I've heard nothing from any of the math committees. I sit on one of the MCAS ADC committees. Um, and, and really we're, we're vetting questions on the MCAS, but I've, and they work directly with DESE as they're creating these questions. And I've heard nothing to lead me to believe they would be changing. However, I'm not saying that, you know, we're- Right, we're so what was just on a, on a very high level, what was like, what was a change in 17? I'm just curious um, what a math standard change would look like. I don't, I don't really, I can't envision it. Um, they change the language around um, function notation, like something like that, okay. which um, for the reality of it, 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 that's something like a kid wouldn't even notice, nor would a parent. Right. So, and not, and I'm happy to share, I can give you some examples of those changes. I'm happy to share with the group. Cause it's like one, it, I would say it's one of those things. It's like, or like the order, another good example, um, geometry, some of the geometry standards move from one of the middle school grades to another middle school grade statistics super heavy in seventh grade and it did not used to be okay all right no i just i was just curious i know we all you know there's a lot of focus on curriculum and so on. i think it usually refers to you know ela and you know history and that sort of thing but i think that it, it's relative to see what changes happen in the math realm as well and it's curious that it's i would agree with you that it's probably something very simple that folks don't even that, that kids nor anyone would really even recognize because math is math, right? I mean, <laughs> it is, but you all may remember too, or just historically, we did make a change to the order of our curriculum. Yep. Um, yep. Where we switch the geometry to our freshman students and algebras to our um, sophomores, which was indicative of helping to support more of those changes, big picture wise. So okay. that's a, that's, it, it does tie into that, Peter. And, and it's too soon to tell if that change in curriculum or change in order has helped, right? Because last year was pandemic and we don't have enough I, data. 
we are super excited to get a real handle on the data. Cause again, like we can look at how kids did on the MCAS in a pandemic year. And the only way we really should use that is diagnostic and looking if there's, you know, for 18 and 19 or any of the trends from 18 and 19. Um, and again, those still don't even help us. So yeah, it's definitely too early, but we are taking a look at like, Hey, what did we move and how is that impacting our kids? Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I have one more question and I'm told you can you can pass on it if it's too much um <laughs> I just, so are you all happy as math teachers and department heads uh, but with Eureka and how that's kind of turned out as something that we've sort of, sort of watched piloted and now it's like kind of really in there and is there any in addition is there anything that you are like you know it would be great to really kind of as our next step to add here would be something I'm just kind of like thinking about budget and future like kind of wish listy stuff i totally appreciate your question um knowing a few years ago there was a handful of teachers using eureka and then there was a lot just for like it it stops at fifth grade and i will tell you that what we know as we receive our sixth graders even with the pandemic last year it was evident to us that kids were getting consistent content and skills and they came to school as sixth graders with those skills even with all the barriers because there was a consistent way of delivering it that was awesome so um to answer that piece yes i would say like as a middle school like group we are happy with that um is there always an opportunity to take a look at ways we can like norm assessments or diagnosing absolutely so um i'm look we're we're looking at some things right now and trying to figure out what's our best way to support students and support kids to to say like hey where's the growth where where can we do better so they come off eureka and then go into what's the next so i would tell you that sixth seventh and eighth grade like i'm not it's not like hey we use mcgraw hill hey we use um it is standards based curriculum delivered through um you know it's a it's a mixture of like things we find that are it, it's the standards based curriculum so it's not eureka it's not envision it's a mixture mm -hmm. of um it's a mixture of ways to deliver the content so it's not like a canned curriculum okay yeah great question great well thank you Ms. Prindle, for the presentation and also um <laughs> answering the litany of questions that we have for you oh well thank you i appreciate the questions <laughs> we're all so interested in math well, I appreciate it. Like, <laughs> it's it's a nice conversation to have. So, thanks. Sure. Uh, so, moving on in the agenda, the next item is the student advisor report with uh, Celia Reese and Johnny Kingsley. Hi. All right. I'll start on tonight. Um, this upcoming Friday is the first ever credit for life for the high school juniors and seniors. It's like a seminar simulation all about financial literacy and learning to budget, which is great because a lot of students feel like, you know, in school, we should teach that kind of thing. And I think that's great. That's going to be awesome. Um, they're still looking for volunteers. If any of you want to help out during the event, it's from 8 a.m. to noon on Friday. Students are able to sign up at College Board as late registration for the November SAT, which is running at the high school on the 6th. And this is the last SAT until the spring. So that's the last for like us seniors applying to colleges, which is exciting and nerve wracking all at the same time. Um, the fall music concert is tomorrow, the 19th at 7 p.m. in the Performing Arts Center. The first SHS talent show in 10 years returned last week with over 12 acts, which was great for the first one. Um, it was great to see the range of talents from our students and staff, and we hope the event returns every year. And same with our homecoming, which we just had last week. We had Spirit Week, and we had um, obviously like a great game on Friday and a clubs carnival before that, which ended up being a great success. And then a homecoming dance on Saturday, and all of it was a lot of fun, and I hope it's a tradition that can continue here because it brought a lot of joy to the students. All right, Johnny. All right, thank you. I've had a lot of connection trouble, so I don't know if you guys can see me or not. I don't think my camera's working. Um, we can hear you, Johnny. But anyway, uh, golf today, we had our um, sectional tournament. Uh, we came in fifth. The top three qual the top three schools qualified, which were uh, Bishop Stang, uh, 
Nauset and uh, Old Rochester. So those three teams qualified. We came in fifth. Uh, and then for field hockey, field hockey won their last five games since um, since we last met on November on November on October fourth. Sorry. Um, boys soccer had two ties and two losses in the last two weeks. Girls soccer has enjoyed four wins and a loss since October fourth. Volleyball has added one more win to their to their standings. Um, and I'd like to uh, reiterate what Celia said. We had a great homecoming weekend. Uh, the football team uh, beat Hanover 21 to 13 and everybody had fun at the homecoming dance where we had uh, two kind of locations set up, one in the small gym and one in the big gym. In the small gym, we had some yard games and some live coverage of the Red Sox game. And then in the big gym, there was music, dancing and decorations. So we had a lot of fun and we're hoping to, like Celia said, to continue that tradition in the future. So thank you for having me back. I know I wasn't at the first meeting. Thank you for having me back this year. Great, no, thanks for coming, Johnny. Um, and, and for the update you both provided tonight. Um, are there any questions from the committee? Yeah, um, I just had one. I thought, I think it's great that you you know, you're both able to talk about the different events that have come back for students. Um, are we seeing that most of the events that were, I mean, so far, obviously we're only a month and a half into school, but, you know, do, do we see that excitement in kids being able to bring back the events that they had before COVID had hit? Or, you know, is it still kind of students trying to figure out what, what they want to bring back and what, you know, fits in now? Yeah, I mean, well, this was our first homecoming in a decade or so. Um, which is like crazy because, you know, every town has one. So I think a lot of students were both excited because of like, you know, COVID cancellations and all being crazy last year, but also because it was the first like we've ever had, like our class was freshmen. So we had a full year. So we could have had it that year if it were something Situate was doing, but because we've never had it before and everyone kind of wants it and we all see posts about it and everything like that. I think people were excited to go and it was a great turnout. There was a ton of people there. So I think, I, you know, everyone's excited, um, I think because of a mix of a two, and I think that'll like carry over into later events in the school year and things that are just about class culture, like pep rallies and like proms and everything like that. I think it's gonna be a really fun and exciting year. Great, I think that's awesome. The more normalcy we can bring into the school year for, for staff and students is, you know, just a better experience for everybody. So that's, that's great to hear. Yeah, totally. All right. Well, thank you both for uh, coming tonight and the updates that you both provided. Uh, so next on the agenda is the leadership report, and we'll start with uh, Superintendent Burkhead. Thank you, Chairman Long, and good evening, everyone. I want to first thank Celia and Johnny for the uh, all the great news and exciting things happening uh, at the high school. Um, it's really great to to hear, and I want to thank all the high school leadership team and all the advisors and students and uh, staff that put that homecoming together. I know it was a lot of work. And, you know, as Celia said, it's something that hadn't happened in a decade. So really important to um, the social part of, of education and the fun and the traditional things that we're trying to establish here. So well done. And I heard there were close to 500 kids at the, um, at the homecoming dance. So uh, really good stuff. And I'm glad people had fun. Uh, I'll roll that into a, another sailor shout out. I've, um, I want to thank our principals for allowing me to come into their first faculty meetings of the year to share uh, the district goals and to have conversations with our staff. Um, it's been really enjoyable to get their feedback. And one of the things uh, that I mentioned to the staff is I would love to be invited into their classes to meet the kids, see our teaching in action, and um, just to see all the great things happening for myself. And a number of teachers have taken me up on that and I wanna thank them. And I wanna put that um, recommendation out there or that invitation out there to please continue to do that. Uh, Mr. Scavato's high school mythology class was the most recent to invite me in. And I was extremely impressed with how they worked collaboratively. That's one of our goals this year, You know, working together in the real world, you have to work as a team, you have to, share ideas and uh, coordinate ideas to come to a decision in a lot of things. And they demonstrate this through identifying expressions of a particular piece of art. 
Um, in fact, Ms. Mr. Scavato had stepped up right outside the classroom and let the students kind of, um, you know, run the show and, and come up with their own way of coming up with the evidence of the artwork and have to support it. So I saw a lot of critical thinking. I saw them including all voices so that everyone had a say in, in, um, in the answers they were gonna provide Mr. Scavato. And I just thought there were high level of critical thinking and reasoning in there and working together as a team. So uh, shout out to all of you. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot and I was very impressed with the class. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, my first ever seaside chat with the community uh, was last week. And uh, we had an afternoon matinee at 1 p.m. at the Senior Center. And then we had a 6 p.m. Um, opportunity in which the focus or the theme for this particular um, chat was on the um, new school building project for the Hatherley. And I just want to thank everybody for taking time to come out. I think it's really important, especially a, a, a new superintendent or at least a second year superintendent after a year of COVID where we had a lot of Zoom meetings to start meeting people in person. Um, the conversations before and after the uh, general conversation were also very uh, helpful and important and powerful to me to get to meet folks, uh, get to know their names and their stories and learn a lot about the town in which I'm superintendent. So that was very helpful. Um, just to remind people that um, there will be a town meeting on the 26th uh, at the high school. And the article that's up for us is the funding of a $1.1 million MSBA project for the new school. And uh, it's an important vote and one we need to continue the process, something that's mandated by the MSBA as we continue through the potential of a, of a new school or renovations to existing schools. Um, along those same lines, again, to uh, get the word out and to be as transparent as possible on the new project of the new Hatherley. Uh, we had uh, tours for members of the school committee, select board and capital planning committee. Also the town administrator attended. So I wanted to also thank those that could make it. It was 9.30 in the morning, so understandable that not everybody can make it. Um, I wanna give a shout out to uh, Mr. Dillon and, and Principal Ward for leading the tour. I wanna to thank all the students and staff while school was in session to allow us to uh, visit their classrooms, see them in action and uh, welcome us. So I think it was um, an eye-opening uh, opportunity and some of the things down the road as we go into the project uh, that will be available to the community also to come in and see you know, after school hours, the, um, the buildings, the condition they're in, to ask questions, to share questions and concerns. And again, I thought that was very powerful. So thank you for all those that could make it. Next, I just want to give um, a shout out to our new leadership team at, uh, at Central Office. Um, the most veteran of the, of the staff is myself at about uh, 15 months. Uh, and Ms. Donahue is, uh, has been awesome as the, uh, as the person there, even longer than me. Everyone else is, is been there less than 15 months. I think we complement each other well. We're working really hard. And I just wanted to give a shout out to our, our newest member, Ms. Driscoll, who will be presenting tonight. She's agreed to present each night as we focus uh, this year on our curriculum and instruction. Um, she has been appointed to a second term on the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education um, Accountability and Assistance Advisory Council. It's a pretty big deal uh, at the state level. In a letter to Ms. Driscoll from the Commissioner of Education, I want to quote him saying, we appreciate your efforts and those of your colleagues on the council to enhance the work of the board and the department to improve public education and advance student achievement in the Commonwealth. For the past several years, this council has played an important role in advising us, meaning the Department of Elementary and education, uh, Secondary Education, on many important policy initiatives, including the design of our framework for accountability and assistance, district reviews, and targeted assistance efforts. Your willingness to volunteer your time and offer your expertise has been an invaluable contribution to these efforts. So thank you, Ms. Driscoll, for um, offering your services to the state, but also to all the students and staff of the state with your um, input to this very important committee that has a lot of power in the state and what we learn and what we assess of our students. So congratulations. Um, that letter in its entirety should be in your backup uh, school committee members. And finally, just want to give a little fall guidance update. Um, 
Last Wednesday, we had a, a meeting with the commissioner, all the superintendents across the straight, the state to discuss uh, issues related to COVID. Uh, as I think we all know, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education via the commissioner has a, a current mask mandate in effect to all mass public schools through the end of October. The commissioner mentioned at this meeting that he will be sharing further guidance before that November 1st date. And um, he has stated that he has not ruled out an extension of the mask mandate, but didn't give any further information on that. We also have a current um, Situa Public Schools mask mandate in effect, or policy, excuse me, in effect. So the current guidance, the most recent guidance that we share with our community uh, from the commissioner in, in the Department of Education, hints that local school committees may ultimately make a decision on lifting mask mandates or policies uh, if vaccinated students and staff of an entire school, including students and staff, reach an 80% uh, threshold, vaccination threshold. So as we await further guidance from the commissioner and the Department of Education, our medical advisory committee has been meeting regularly. Uh, we continue to meet, monitor our COVID numbers, the town numbers, and our vaccination rates. Um, my recommendation to the school committee would be that the medical advisory committee uh, present at the next meeting, which, we, which timely enough is November 1st, uh, and share all the data we've collected as of the opening in school through November 1st, um, including town COVID numbers, school COVID numbers, vaccination rates uh, that we're still collecting as of the meeting and any metrics that we could use to assist the committee and make an educated decision on the potential to change or lift the current mask policy should the commissioner not extend the current mask mandate. So that's a little background on where we're at and, and my suggestion and timelines according to uh, the commissioner. And that concludes my report. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Burkett. Are there any uh, questions from the committee? I, okay. I have a couple of questions for Bill. Um, regarding the 80% threshold uh, for schools, uh, is the fact that, um, you know, Situate had the middle school and the high school are basically attached, and we have middle school students and high school students that ride the bus together, is that something that we have to factor in? Or is that something the, the the um, the medical advisory committee will be discussing. Yeah, we we've discussed both, and we'd look for some guidance on the bus issue from uh, Desi. I think there's other towns that do that. Um, my understanding is that our schools are not um, the middle school and high school do not exchange students. They do not have passage passageways where they come and go like some middle and high schools combined do. So I wouldn't I wouldn't count that as as one building. In fact, the doors are locked and there's pretty explicit signage that says do not enter here, do not go there. So we treat our middle and high school as two separate schools. Um, I believe other schools may not do that, so they may be considered one. But certainly there's something that we would share with Desi before making that decision and have for you at the presentation. Uh, the same with the buses where the students would um, share the buses, which is not the case in every district. So that again is something unique to us that we would have to have answered before that presentation and, and, and great questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Superintendent Burkhead? Um, I just had one, uh, Bill. So we, we got an email earlier today. So the Board of Education is meeting tomorrow. Um, I think they're giving an update on, on the masking mandate. Do you, have you heard they're going to be continuing meetings over the next week and a half while um, you know we get to that 11th or November 1st date, or is that still kind of up in the air and you haven't really heard anything yet? Yeah, I, the commissioner didn't mention that. Typically, their meetings, they don't have emergency meeting. I don't know them to do that in the past. They've kept their, their meetings. So I think when he typically updates us the week before their meetings, it's on a lot of items that he shared with us. So I think what he also talked about was the test and stay program, getting schools some help with that. Uh, we've been just recently recently receiving that, hadn't had that before. We are one of uh, a handful of schools doing the test and stay. Not all schools are doing that. We, and our our nurses and nurse leader have been doing Yeoman's work to 
uh, keep our kids in school and can conduct those. So I think that was a lot of what he was talking about is they're working on getting help for the test and state programs. Uh, he didn't have a lot of lot to say about the mass mandate, so I don't um, I don't know that that's going to be a, a topic on tomorrow's meeting or if they'll likely have a meeting before um, the next one before November first. Okay, but it, it, I, we got the email. It is on their agenda tomorrow, so that's why I it is. Yeah. So then we'll probably have another commissioner's meeting when when he told us there'll be further guidance. He's probably going to get direction from the board, and then that will trickle down to us. Okay, I wasn't sure if this is one of those things where we're here, you know as our kids are trick-or-treating on 1031 or, you know, a couple of days before, you know, whatever the, the case may be. Ideally, yeah, I, you know, the more time we have to make a decision and the more information, the better. And, and I completely agree with you. Um, our nurse leader and all of our nurses are doing an amazing job at, you know, either the test and stay or just keeping kids healthy and safe and, you know, taking on the extra work that they've had to take on um, this year. Thank you. And I'm glad you pointed broke a point about, um, you know, the timeline, I think we just, um, we have to, we have to wait to the commissioner gives us that guidance because as we know it, uh, it changes a lot. And um, he has said there will be further guidance out. So I'm sure he's waiting for that board make, meeting to get some guidance from his board and to share with us. So I think we'll have uh, some more information and make a, which will allow us to make a better decision uh, at, on November 1st. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so next on the agenda is the assistant superintendent's report. And as you unmute, uh, congratulations on being appointed back to the uh, Desi Advisory Council. Oh, thank you very much. It was, um, it'll be a pleasure to serve until 2025. Um, and I appreciate the shout out, um, Superintendent Burkhead. That was very nice and unexpected. Um, so what I am sharing with you today um, for my report is a little bit of information about a new partnership um, that we've started uh, to improve and inc increase college readiness. Um, some of you may be familiar with this organization. In the past, it's been called MIMSI, um, but now it is called Mass Insight. It's an education um, and research organization that supports um, success in college. So if uh, I will share my screen. Okay. Um, so the first thing that I would like to share with you um, are the goals. So basically, as obviously you know our goals um, to support academic and personal excellence, the goals of our partnership with Mass, Mass Insight are these three, to increase participation, in advanced placement courses. Mass Insight focuses on math, science, and English because according to research, success in those AP courses translates into college success. More students graduating within four years. Um, more students not needing um, those courses that don't qualify towards uh, college graduation. Um, the second bullet is increased performance. So more qualifying scores three, fours, fives on AP examinations. And again, this organization helps us do that. Um, and the third bullet, as I mentioned, college success, more students matriculating to graduating from college, but that doesn't just mean getting there. It means getting there and, and being prepared and not needing a five or six year plan, no matter what the college. I mean, if you have, I, I can't see everybody's face, obviously, because of Zoom, I just see my gigantic um, slideshow. If anyone has a question or um, Mr. Long, if you have questions during this and you want me to stop, um, I would love to um, explain as we're on any of these particular slides. Um, so for some people who aren't sure um, what AP actually is, it is a university level freshman course that some, you take in high school. Every single AP course has a national exam at the end. Um, sometimes people confuse honors with AP. Honors is typically an accelerated course, but it is not aligned with national standards. Honors is aligned with our Massachusetts standards. And in mathematics, oh, also Miss Grendel, wonderful presentation, little shout out to her. Um, if you look at the mathematics standards that were updated in 2017, you'll see little stars next to certain standards. Math is a subject that actually explicitly explains which standards are honors and which are not. 
Um, but regardless, AP has a national set of standards and for every single AP exam, it's, um, it is not our, our personal standards for Massachusetts. So that's why a lot of colleges look at this for acceptance because it is measured against a national baseline. Um, the score is one through five, five being the best. With a score of three or higher, you can typically earn college credit while in high school. Now that doesn't mean that if I am an engineering major, a score of three on Calc 1 allows me to skip Calc 1 with all the engineering majors. Like anything else, um, colleges get to decide um, what works best for their programs and their students. Just like placement exams, I'm sure you've heard of AccuPlacer. That's a placement exam that all sorts of colleges use. Even though they may use the same exam, different colleges have different thresholds for what gets you into certain courses. Um, and of course, um, the purpose of, of, uh, for college admissions is that college admissions can make judgments about um, who they would like to accept from all over the country based against um, a common reference. So I have to move this over so I can see this a little better. Uh, so, can I stop right, you then ask a question? Oh yeah. So for the, actually as you were going through it, my question was around the responses for colleges on the AP. Is there, I mean, is every college completely different that we're seeing or is it, you know, there's some kind of, stand, I know, three or higher, it's typically what you need to get, but you know, are colleges trying to push for a, a higher score there or is it really, you know, very it, unique college by college? It is, it absolutely depends on the college. Typically, if you look at the UMass system with Massachusetts state colleges, they're similar, but again, even the thresholds for the um, admissions um, into regular courses with AccuPlacer look very different. So it is literally college by college. For the most part, and, and again, if you have questions about specific courses, these are, our partnership with Mass Insight will help us work with what's best for our students and answer those questions for us. For the most part, a three or higher does earn college credit. It may not count for your major for certain things, but it absolutely counts as an elective, um, but it, it depends on the actual course. Um, so there are two different Englishes, for example. One might count for um, writing one and writing two at certain schools and get rid of those core English classes, but it may not eliminate a higher level English course, for example. So it is important that when we're working in AP and recruiting for AP and communicating with parents, um, which I have on a later slide, um, it is important that we talk about the opportunities, advantages, and sometimes disadvantages so that every single student is choosing the right pathway for themselves. Heidi, I have a question about the, um, the scores mm -hmm. um, or the, the, the colleges themselves. Do they tell, like, do they put out, um, do, do the students know ahead of time what score is required, like what the colleges are looking for in order in what that score means? So if they have a particular college in mind, then they know, you know, what they have to shoot for. So I would say, I mean, my personal opinion is that we're shooting for fives. Right. Period. Yeah. You know, that, that's yeah. what we're all yeah. shooting. For. Yeah. However, um, they, school, colleges typically don't publish those thresholds. They typically don't publish their AccuPlace or thresholds. Um, it's something that can be a moving target. It's not something that this school has this cut off for the past 25 years. It's mm -hmm. something that um, schools, uh, adjust as necessary. Um, so there's no place you would go. And I, I really do advise against, if we know, for example, at a certain college, absolutely you get a three and you're going to get credit for X, Y, Z. I really, just like about MCAS, it, it, I cringe a little when I hear people say, oh, you can pass the MCAS. We don't wanna just pass, we wanna be the best. Um, so when you, we are in AP classes and we're working with students, the goal is, to get a five. If you have a five, you have the best best case scenario. Um, and again, those types of scores and that participation helps with admission in the first place, um, which is step one. Great. Thank you. Yeah, of course. May I go on? Good. Okay. Um, so these are numbers that, that Mass Insight provided us. Um, and this is the high school exams taken 
in math, science, and English. Now, this particular group supports us with math, science, and English. Many of the practices will be transferable to the other AP courses. And I'll talk about the steering committee in a minute. They absolutely will be able to scale those up in the future. But I wanted you to know that as of today, in math, science, and English, we have an enrollment of 497 students in AP courses. Dr. McGuire um, worked with the state to get um, an AP STEM expansion um, funding opportunity through virtual high school. So now that number was increased with some um, uh, computer science principals and environmental science students. So we're up to 514. If you look at the number of students in advanced placement, including art, music, world languages, psychology, and social studies, we're at 752 students. Now here is our challenge. This is the number of qualifying scores. So looking at enrollment is not the same as looking at the number of students who test and is not looking at the same as the number of students who actually get a qualifying score, three or better. So for example, when I look at 203 in 2020, we need to be aware that 317 students took the exam, but only 203 got threes or better. In 2019, 394 students took exams, but only 221 got threes or better. And if so, if you compare these numbers, we really have lots of students testing, but the qualifying isn't matching the number. Um, so that is something that Mass Insight is going to help us with and scale up. Um, because we know the standards, we need to use um, the strategies to make sure that our students are competitive with our surrounding districts and with students across the country. So what is it that Mass Insight does for and with us? Heidi, so, can I take you for one second? Oh, yeah, yeah. On the, um, on the enrollment numbers and so on, there could be an enrollment, like one student could be taking four AP courses, correct? So Absolutely. that's not actually the number of students, it's just a number of, um, I don't know. Opportunities, opportunities, opportunities. yes. Okay. So I think it will, obviously the data that you that we have is great, but it would be helpful to know of one student, you know, represents maybe four, four of the passing school, four of the five, school, you know, four of the, how can I say it? One student may be represented by four fives, right? Which, which may be even skew the numbers even worse, right? Like if one student, if 317, there really could only, you know, maybe only a hundred students actually had qualifying scores. So we really need to look by the number of exams, regardless, stu the, the individual student situation, we, mm -hmm. need, we can look at separately. And I, I, I hope my own children get several fives on four exams. But mm -hmm. when we are looking at the amount of courses that we have, the amount of opportunities for tests, regardless of the amount of students, we need students to get passing scores. That's the purpose. That demonstrates that you've mastered this course. So if I'm a student taking four, four classes, I should be getting threes or better in all of them. Um, it doesn't really speak to the overall um, quality of our programming if we're looking at that. Well, we had got those scores because it was Joey. Mm -hmm. Really, when we're looking at numbers like this, we have to get to these strategies to make sure that everyone is supporting all students to get to those qualifying scores. Okay. But when you get, you're right, eventually, and at the classroom level, should teachers be looking at that 100%. Any other questions before I explain the, the supports? Okay. Um, and I'm sorry, I keep looking up, but I have two screens. I have your pictures up here, so I'm trying to look at you while I'm, uh, while I'm looking at the PowerPoint. Um, so the, the key benefits um, are, are what we have here, um, and this supports a culture of personalization and collaboration. The academic support, um, this saves us some money. So um, in the past, if we wanted our teachers to take a summer institute for advanced placement to become an advanced placement teacher or to go to the two-day college board workshops, um, we would have to pay for those. Because of our partnership, 
it's included. Um, our every AP teacher has the opportunity to go to these two day workshops. There are also workshops for administrators, people at the district level, to make sure that we are working directly with college board experts. It cuts the middleman. Um, it isn't us searching for a product. It is just us works, working with college board. Um, the other thing that is really great is that every AP teacher gets a mentor and there's a content director. So that mentor not only will model lessons um, in AP classrooms and work really, almost like a cooperating teacher kind of um, relationship, they will also help them with the most up-to-date supports. So if you don't know, um, last year, maybe it started the year before as a pilot, um, there are, there are AP, there's an AP platform now online that has all sorts of resources, up-to-date resources, the most um, the progress monitoring, like you might see for um, reading, um, progress monitoring as you go through the course. Those tools, they're so in depth, just having a, a, a one, an hour and a half PD on it is not enough. So these people support our teachers to make sure they have not only have access to, but can use at an can use these things at an expert level for the best, um, so our students can have the best experience. Um, we also end up getting some small grants for equipment and supplies for our students. And the two most wonderful things um, for our students that we didn't have an opportunity to do before are the Saturday student study sessions. So through Mass Insight. Um, they collaborate with um, partner districts in our area, and there are almost like professional development for students. There are also opportunities for teachers at those um, where they train our students in um, whatever it is, whatever their AP exam actually is, and they will be sitting next to the same people who will be competing for college acceptance um, across the country. Um, so we will see uh, much more before the AP exam, where our students are and where they need to be. The other thing is we have a mock exam opportunity and that's run through um, this additional time. So students will take a mock exam and that mock exam is scored by partner teachers, not only by the teacher in the classroom. And that's wonderful, wonderful feedback before the actual exam. Um, so this partnership, um, this collaboration, um, I guess model uh, is something that the steering committee, uh, which uh, at the high school is working with Mass Insight for, and that's uh, Dr. McGuire, the principal, Karen Hughes, the assistant principal, Liz Grindle, the math department chair, Patrick Newton, the science department chair, and Kate Harwood, who is one of our ELA AP teachers. Um, and that team meets together to set goals, have conversations, work with Mass Insight, and make sure that we are getting our students and teachers the support they need. Um, and what we will look at directly is enrollment, qualifying scores, um, and not only will we report out on this, but Mass Insight will, um, will share the same. And Heidi, can I ask a question? Yes, absolutely. So before you go forward, so previous to now, students were not getting any of these types of supports at all for AP coursework, nor were teachers for their role in all of it either. Or is this to replace something that was previously there at all or different, not working, or this is like a brand new, never this, had at Situate? This thing? is this is new, never, never had at Situate. Um, so when I came on, um, Superintendent Burkhead made it very clear to me um, that my focus needs to be academic achievement. I better be looking at that data. We better make sure that we're doing everything, working on the whole student. Um, so one of the things in short this summer, um, we looked at were those AP scores um, and the, uh, the potential that we have um, at our school district. And Dr. McGuire jumped right in um, on that um, opportunity for the AP expansion. And that's, that's where that started. Um, so we signed on with Mass Insight because of the mentorship and the, profession, the personalized professional development. So that's what's really different is it's not just send them to a workshop and hope everything works out. So if I am a part of Mass Insight and I am 
it working on my lessons and I have a question with my students, I can call my mentor. I can literally get that support in the moment throughout the year. Um, and it's, um, it's hugely beneficial. And might it be something we do for a few years and then we're on a traje trajectory so that we don't continue when we maybe have our own model in-house, that is entirely possible. Um, but right now that's where we are. And I don't wanna put you on the spot, but I see Dr. McGuire here right now. Um, I, I know that she mentioned um, that there, there are a few things that the teachers, some favorite things that the teachers have from the partnership so far. So I don't know if you want to reiterate anything, Lisa, that I didn't cover. Okay. Heidi, I had a couple of questions. Um, I think I heard you say at the beginning of the presentation that one of the reasons to focus on AP was uh, around persistence in college. Did I hear you say that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I know that I can access our graduation rates and college attendance, like going to higher ed on the um, DESTI website. So I see that we have, you know, almost 90% of our students go to some college or university. I'm curious, um, and maybe Dr. McGuire, this is a question for you. Are we, do we have data on how our students are doing in college in terms of persistence? And so like, I'm just curious at the end of the day, how will we know this is successful, I guess, is, is, is my question. Yes, so in the past couple of years, we just started collecting that data by developing an alumni database. Uh, and we've been building that every year that I've been at the high school. That's something that Tammy and and I took over uh, and started uh, just five, this fifth year this year. So we are tracking one year, two year, five year, 10 year um, and beyond and um, administering surveys to see. The first is, how did you fare in your first year? Are you going back for year number two? Uh, how have we prepared you? Were there gaps in learning that you wished you had learned something about? Uh, did you finish college in four years? Did you finish by the fifth year uh, survey? So that we have that and we can directly use that to inform our practice. So we're building that right now and we'll have the data coming in over time. Great, thank you, Dr. McGuire. The other question I had was, um, to what extent does this partnership also address access to AP, not just being successful, but also access, you know, going back to Peter's question around the number of students taking, I see head shaking. Yes. So maybe there's. So that is part of the steering committee's work. Uh, we also attended a two day training and we have monthly coaching calls and uh, targets and, and many goals that we have to set along the way. And one of the things that we are looking at is access. So that includes things like, um, how is our program of studies written? Is it about scope and sequence or is it about gatekeeping measures that we could eliminate like a minimum score in your previous class? We wanna say if a student is willing to put in the work and articulates that he or she wants to take the next class and challenge themselves in AP, they shouldn't need a 90 in their last year's course to be able to do that. Um, what are the other ways that we can uh, support students, whether it's in summer work or um, different courses in their time to be ready for APs? And then is there a way to expand access so that all students have the opportunity, like in, a, in an AP light experience, there are le not less rigorous, but different types of, you know, not lab-based APs, like an AP seminar that freshmen could take. They don't um, need those higher level prerequisites for the content but it gives them the exposure to the type of learning and the type of research and interaction and collaboration they, they would do for success at AP. And if we can get to a model where our freshmen all have that experience, then that's like, that's where we wanna go. Um, so those are the kinds of things we're looking at now. How can we um, motivate kids? And that starts down at sixth and seventh grade to have those conversations with teachers there as well but also to give them access and exposure right as they enter the high school and that everybody can have that positive experience and opportunity. And then as they select the courses they're passionate about, they can continue on in the AP program. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. So there's something I love that Dr. McGuire just said, she used the word gatekeeper. That is something that Mass Insight is absolutely going to help us change from, from any part of AP being gatekeeping to a gateway. The, that seminar course and the companion research course are gateways 
to, um, to advanced placement. Um, and we need to, it, it's just really exciting. And I think there's so much potential here. Uh, I have a, a comment um, about, uh, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, the, the students- Not over are, yet, Janice. All right, how you got more to go? No. What? No, that oh, was done. my that was my last oh, slide. Oh, I thought you I thought we kept interrupting you. No, Jan, no? she stopped sharing, so that that's a sign. It did. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I've heard about students who have like four or five AP classes, and I can't imagine the pressure you know that they put on themselves, and you know, and I'm so happy to hear that they were going to have some supports for them, even like the practice tests. You know, hopefully, you know. Um, because part of, you know, we know that part of our educating our students is making sure their emotional well being is taken care of as well. So I'm really happy to hear that. I might, I have another question about the, um, the number of students that you have that, um, that took, that were eligible for a test, but you compare it to this number of students right, enrolled in AP classes. Um, do you take into account students that are enrolled in AP classes, but choose not to take the AP tests? Like, well, is that there, there are students in AP classes who do not take the AP test. What I shared with you today are the number of actual tests taken and the number of um, qualifying scores. But that is a that is a whole nother. Yes, there are students who take oh, okay. yeah. um, AP classes, but do not take the exam. So what Mass Insight shares with us is that even if a student does not take the exam, the experience of being in an advanced placement course, regardless of your A, B, C, whatever your grade is, does put you on track for more college success because you are using national standards and um, working at the level of a college freshman. Um, so that, that's what they share. So expanding access doesn't necessarily mean forcing 900,000 students to test. That's not what that is. Okay. I was just wondering if the, that 315 number was the number of students enrolled in No, that's, that's the number of tests that were taken. Okay. What Thank I shared you. for this year, because we haven't taken the test yet, I shared the number of students enrolled in those classes who could take tests, but okay. we don't have that yet because they'll be taking them this spring. Okay. Great. Thank you. Great question. All right, if there are no more questions, I'd love to just really thank that steering committee for working so closely with Mass Insight. Um, I, I think they've done a fabulous job. Yeah, I actually have two quick questions for you. Um, and, and Janice has one that I had earlier, but um, just, just in general, just a general question. Do, do teachers have to have certain licensing or certifications in order to teach an AP exam, a class, or is it just a teacher can uh, choose to teach it if they choose to? That's a good question. Um, so they need their actual Massachusetts license. Uh, there is no actual licensure, um, but it is highly recommended that teachers go through the uh, AP teacher training. It's a week long course in the summer. Um, and if I am not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, teachers who teach in situate do take that training prior to. Um, if there were a situation where oh, I, we needed so-and-so to teach a certain course, an AP course, because we had so many people um, who wanted to take it, for one year, a teacher is allowed to use the syllabus of someone else and update that um, and then take the course and make their own. Um, there's a, a whole AP process where um, our AP coordinator has to submit every single syllabus. So what College Board does, in, they don't really look for the certification per se, they look for a syllabus that meets the rigor and demands of the College Board course. It's called the AP Ledger, if you wanna look that up to see which ones are approved. Okay, thank you. And then in terms of feedback for students, like, you know, they go, they take the exam, do they just get a one to five back? Or do they actually get some kind of feedback from the state saying, hey, you got a two, but it was close, two or three, and here's, where you didn't necessarily do all in the test. Um, so what what they get back, and it, it doesn't all. They changed it last year, actually. I think for the first time we got writing back. Isn't that correct? We got their responses back, um, and they didn't always do that. Um, so I'm not positive what every single test gets back. 
Um, but in the portal, the AP teacher does get their individual um, student results. Okay, so it would be interesting to see, you know, if kids are getting A's and, and B's in the class, you know, you, and we know that they're hitting the, the rigor and they're getting the, the concept of what's being taught, but then they're getting like a two on the exam, you know, where that, that gap is, because obviously we want the kids to get the less than more than necessarily pass the test, but, you know, making sure that we're preparing them as well as possible to take that test and, and to move on to college. And, and I feel like teachers, teachers everywhere, they, they take it very seriously, the messaging about where um, students are throughout the year. And I think that them using this AP platform um, with the regular progress monitoring lets students and parents, you can ask your kids to see it, um, you can log on and see that um, throughout the year, which is a, a great feature. Great, thank you. Um, are there any other questions for Ms. Driscoll? Well, thank you for that detail in the presentation. Thank you. Uh, so next on the agenda is an update from uh, Dr. Dutch. Good evening. Um, thanks for the opportunity to share uh, with you. Uh, I've got two, two folks with me who are going to be doing a presentation, uh, Kate Canny and Maureen Tull from an organization called PARS. Uh, PARS is an acronym for Public Agency Retirement Services. They'll be presenting regarding an early retirement plan known as a separation incentive plan. It's a constructive tool to reduce labor costs. Tonight, Kate and Maureen will share their no cost comprehensive analysis based on their model to help us determine whether an incentive is feasible. Uh, I'd ask if you could allow uh, Kate and Maureen to uh, unmute and to share their to share their screen. Uh, Kate will need to share her screen. Both have the ability. Maureen, Kate, if you want to try to unmute yourselves, you should be able to. Maureen, are you good? Yes, I'm good. Thank you. Yes, I'm good. There you go. All right. Kate, would you like me to get started here? Kate, would you like me to get started here? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. So, can everybody uh, see the screen? So, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I um, have a short period of time here, but I, I've been asked uh, uh, to share an analysis that we have done, uh, as uh, Dr. Dutch has uh, explained, to um, analyze the feasibility of offering an incentive uh, to, uh, to teachers. And so I'm going to present that analysis to you. And I'm open for questions. You go to the next slide here. So uh, before I get started, just wanted to let you know, um, PARS, Public Agency Retirement Services, is a national specialist in the analysis, design, consulting, um, and implementation of what I would call district-controlled uh, voluntary early retirement or separation incentives. Uh, and we've been doing this since 1983. Uh, we've done it thousands of times uh, for um, over 450 school district clients in the Northeast, the Midwest, the West. Uh, and I won't go into too much detail here, but um, at the bottom of the screen there, it shows the size. We've done a number of them, the size of, of Situate, but, uh, but also some of the largest to top 20 in the, in the country. And so our analysis modeling has sort of stood the test of time since 1983, it's been used, uh, you know, with the largest being Los Angeles Unified with 562,000 students to, to, to some a very small. So the model that we use for an analysis isn't, uh, you know, is, isn't dependent really on size. Um, and so if you go to the next slide. And just uh, real quick here, uh, uh, when we're talking about analyzing an incentive, what we, we're talking about here is a one-time offer that encourages the el eligible employees to, uh, to retire or resign earlier than they normally would. So in essence, what you're trying to do is accelerate natural attrition, take credit earlier than you would normally to create additional savings and 
Uh, as Dr. Dutch mentioned, this is really first and foremost a fiscal tool. So the analysis helps you figure out whether it makes sense um, from a budgetary fiscal you know, cash flow. Um, it, uh, it can also be used to reorganize, restructure, to mitigate other cuts, um, and, and in, in it's meet the, um, the mutual needs of, of labor um, and administration. And so let me just briefly, before I cover the analysis that we did, explain the analysis methodology that we use. Uh, Kate, if you go to the next slide. Uh, so in essence, what we're doing here is we've got uh, data that the district has provided for us, including employee census and, and other information. But we're using this data to, uh, to, to basically uh, look at this. Uh, we're comparing the total compensation differential between the retiring employee and the replacement employee. This is one of the reasons these are commonly done in school districts. Uh, you take the teacher group, which we're analyzing here on the top of the salary scale teacher, um, there may be a significant compensation gap between the replacement. And so you can create savings from that, but you also have to factor in certain costs. Um, and oftentimes districts may get this wrong because they don't consider all of the costs that you have to, um, that you have to take away from the savings with. So retiree healthcare costs is one, the cost of the incentive itself, the cost of uh, natural attrition, meaning if typically six go out in a year and you get 20 to go, um, those six are a cost. You only can create savings over the additional 14 because you're giving an incentive to those that would have gone anyways. Then we also look at a more complicated factor and that's the loss of future natural attrition. So if you typically get six to go in a year and you get 20, then in future years, you're going to get three, four, you're going to suppress natural attrition. This is one of the reasons you don't want to do these very often because you're, um, you're, you're in essence, um, have, a, have a cost in the future. You're taking credit for savings earlier. And then of course, if there's any um, non-replacement, either temporarily or permanently, that creates savings. And in essence, what we're done with this analysis is we ran out with your employee census and other data. What happens if you don't do an incentive in this particular year? What kind of savings are you gonna create by uh, employees leaving, retiring over time? And we looked at that. So we ran, ran, ran out that without, um, without incentive. And then we compared or overlaid it with what would happen if you offered incentive at different assumptions of benefit levels. And basically we compared the two. So it's not a budgetary or a cash flow modeling, but it's basically, does it make sense? Is status quo better than doing the incentive? So th that's the, the basic analysis that we've done. And if we go forward here to the next slide, real quick, uh, in uh, the design of this, uh, typically in Massachusetts, commonly, this is a supplemental supplement to MTRS. It's, a, uh, it's separate and supplemental to it but cash is offered. So like a one-time cash amount, but the IRS only allows you to pay it over one year. So what we find in our analysis is that it doesn't, it doesn't create savings right away. You wanna get savings as soon as they leave. Say they leave by June 30th, you wanna create savings right away, July 1st, the next fiscal year. But cash, but if you have to pay the cost up front, so we recommended uh, analyzing a design where uh, the IRS allows for an employer to make a post, post-employment contributions on behalf of a retiree to a 43B. This is different than a regular 43B and we're not a 43B sales uh, in, in that business, but it is a vehicle that you can use. And so it allows for the district to fund the cost of it over five years and it tends to work better. And then it allows tax deferral options. So Uncle Sam doesn't take a big cut of whatever you, you're, you're offering as the incentive. So that we looked at that. Um, and if you skip a, a couple slides, Kate, um, I'll show you what that, that looks like. There you go. So um, what we did look at here, this is, this is what it would look like if you could um, pay out over time. Um, and so what we analyzed here was a 75% of final pay and a 60% of final pay. So the average employee here is um, in this teacher group, the, the average for that group was 
and 3,000. So in essence, it's a one-time spend amount uh, uh, because this is not a defined benefit. This is a defined contribution. Uh, so there's no ongoing liability, but it's a one-time spend amount of about um, 75,000, sorry. Uh, let me look at this real quick here. Uh, it's 77, about 78,000 at the 75% of final pay and it's a, or a one-time spend amount at the 60% of final pay of 62,000. And so what, what we do here is we annuitize this so um, they can take it however they want. They can take lifetime payouts. Um, they, can, they can take lifetime payouts with payment to spouse or they can take it just fixed payments over time. Because we analyze funding this over five years, you can see here they can uh, they can take it for in monthly payments. Uh, this supplemental incentive for um, about thirteen hundred dollars a month uh, until it ends in five years, and so on. So the idea here is to give different types of options to increase participation, and the IRS you can even do it lump sum this way too, but they can tax defer it. It's not compensation, so they can roll it in with an IRA, put it into their own four three B take it as cash, turn it on or off, and it gives them more, more options for taking it. Uh, the reason the shortest period of time they can take it is five years is because in the analysis, we fund it over five years. But that gives you an example of what it might look like, the offer might look like to the teacher that is eligible. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, Kate, Right, Kate, can you move it? There you go. Thank you. So uh, the assumptions that we use is we use teachers that are eligible to retire under MTRS. So 55 and 10 years or age, uh, um, any age with 20 years. Um, and, and we use, because we're using current census from this school year, June 30th, 2022 is, is when they ha would have to resign. I mentioned the benefit levels. Uh, we we used an average replacement of fifty-seven thousand um, dollars replacement employee salary, and we looked at healthcare costs, colas, salary progressions, a lot of other other types of um, uh, criteria. And if you go into the next slide, please. So this is what it looked like. The average of that group, age-wise, was fifty-six point nine five, and you can see that they're sprinkled between. 42 and 72 based on the uh, the eligibility criteria, which was eligibility under MTRS to retire. So um, really, we would probably uh, in our projections uh, not focus on those in their 40s, but those in their 50s and beyond. Um, and uh, if you go to the next slide, we also look at the years of service, and this can help us project how many might take at different benefit levels. Uh, you can see here when you match age and years of service, uh, this group is fairly, you know, ripe for an incentive, um, uh, particularly those that are higher in age. Um, but we always like to uh, to base the criteria on age and service. You don't want to do solely do it on age uh, for uh, for various reasons. And so, um, so this group uh, looks like it could have potential for an incentive at this point in time but would meet the needs of the district. On the next slide. So uh, with our projections for this group of 95, as I showed, uh, we project 20 would go. This is just over 21%. I mean, we've done this thousands of times. It's a little low. And the reason it's a little low is because the criteria under MTRS is, uh, is, you know, any age. And so you see some, some in their 40s, which you don't see in a lot of teacher uh, retirement systems. So, um, so that means the overall group we're, we're looking at about uh, just over 20% at 75%, and then uh, a little lower at the 65%. Um, percent. And then we're a natural attrition's at six. So this is uh, we have to factor in that there is that the current natural attrition is a cost in here. Um, normally, we, in our analysis, uh, we end up getting more than we project, but we like to be conservative because this is a decision-making document. And the next slide. 
So uh, what we did here at these benefit levels, and I, I should mention that we do run a lot of different benefit levels. We like a percentage of pay because it's more egalitarian across the group. If you give a flat dollar amount, um, those that are lower paid get a higher amount than those are, that are higher paid and you're trying to get the higher paid out to create fiscal savings. So uh, you can you know, set up the design however you want, but we use a percentage of pay. We find with schools, once you get down below 40 or 50% of final pay, it, you're not beating natural attrition enough. So you gotta have enough of incentive to beat natural attrition. Um, and so that's, that's where we arrived on looking at these two uh, benefit levels. And uh, let's see here. Uh, so uh, what we looked at is if you replace every single teacher um, that uh, that retires under the incentive, uh, there are there are savings that you will create projected in the first year about three hundred and fifty four thousand, uh, and over five years six hundred and seventy one thousand. Uh, and in the sixth year, when you would you finish paying it off because you can have five years to fund it. Um, so you're paying one one fifth of the incentive each year. You tend to have more savings. And then we did run out ten years, but Really, it's much. It, it's easier to focus on the first five years, um, and then if you didn't replace two of those teachers, the the saving a greater savings is created, and so on because you have some non-replacement. We can analyze not replacing a teacher for say, uh, you know, one year and then replacing that, so on. Um, but you can see here there's more savings created by um, by non-replacement, um, and the sixty percent of final pay. Uh, the savings aren't as great because you're not going to get as many. I projected 16 rather than 20 um, with a lesser benefit. And so um, because you create savings at 100% replacement, the higher benefit, to, uh, to, it works, seems to work in this situation. And then if you go to the next slide, uh, and then this this is an example of the actual analysis where we ran out, it's hard to see this maybe, but the natural attrition over the next 10 years, you're gonna create as those employees cycle out about 16.3 uh, billion in savings. Um, and so we show it year by year and such. Um, and, but then we also show what happens if you do the incentive. Uh, in a lot of cases, it, it's, it's, it, it, it doesn't work. Uh, in this case, it does uh, 17.5 um, million in savings uh, over and above what you would have um, what what you would have gotten. So really, the difference there over time is about a you know 1.1 million, and then we show the difference over time there. Uh, and so that's that's what we run out for all of the scenarios. So at this point, um, I'd like to um, I've given you a lot of information. Uh, I'd like to ask if you have any questions about all this information that I've provided. Are there any questions from the uh, the rest of the committee? I, I have just one. So this is, I'm assuming, a completely um, optional plan that if, if teachers chose to take it, they could, and not necessarily something that is, is forced upon them. Absolutely, it's it's always um, it should be voluntary. Uh, you would establish a window, typically forty five to sixty days, uh, to offer, uh, and they would get individual benefit illustrations, and you would communicate to it. What I recommended the design, what we talked to Dr. Dutch about, was um, in essence, if if it makes sense to do it, um, this ask the school committee for the opportunity to open the window. But in the communications to the employees said, it has to meet our fiscal and operational objectives at the end of the window. So at the end of the window, when you know exactly who's leaving, you, you can fine tune the replacement scenarios uh, and the operational impacts. And you can decide based on that post window analysis, the school committee can decide whether it wants to move forward. Uh, and I would say about 90% of our school districts do these have a contingency opt out because you never want to offer incentives that's not going to work. And so you want to, and so you have to communicate that to the employees. Uh, we, we used to say sometimes it's gotta meet the numbers, certain numbers or certain fiscal savings. But now we, we recommend that you 
uh, make the criteria something like it's got to meet our fiscal and operational objectives at the end of the window. So, um, so there's an ultimately a, a decision made by the school committee at the end. Okay. No, th thank you for clarifying that. I was, I was missing the whole optional part as you were presenting, and I wanted to make sure that that, that was the case. Mike, if there are no other questions, I just like to clarify how this, you know, the context of where this all came about. If that's okay with you. Yep, no, that makes perfect sense. Sure. Um, so through the, through the process of of negotiations this past year, uh, where I'm I'm new to the to the district, we came to the realization that we've got um, a significant portion of our staff are on the top step and um, have been in the district for quite a while, have been teaching for quite a while and, and may be looking for a way to retire. Um, so what this does is it, it creates a mutually beneficial opportunity um, for the district to achieve some savings uh, while at the same time providing an opportunity for somebody who may be a year to maybe three years from retiring and uh, is ready, would like to retire, uh, but really can't, can't do so yet at this point uh, financially. This gives them that opportunity to uh, retire a little bit earlier without uh, the financial penalties that they might normally get through uh, early retirement without the incentive. So that was uh, the intent of this was to find a mechanism uh, that would allow us to achieve some cost, cost savings while providing uh, both a benefit and an opportunity for someone who was thinking about retiring uh, within the next few years anyway, uh, and may do so a little bit earlier uh, to enjoy their retirement, their health and the opportunity while they, while they, while they could. So. Uh, that was basically the impetus uh, behind this. Okay, Th thank you for explaining that, Dr. Dutch, and that makes um, total sense. And I mean, any uh, obviously, we want to keep our staff who, who want to be here, and you know, we have amazing staff across all of our schools. It's just making sure that you know we work with them. Um, obviously, we as a school committee have a obligation to the budget, but you know, we also have a um, you know, we have to make sure that our kids are getting the full rigor of a, a full education. So that, that is kind of missing a little bit in the presentation. So that's why, you know, I just want to make sure that was clarified. But thank, thank you for that additional detail. Yep. Yeah, I was purely looking at it from the, the financial perspective, I understand. <laughs> okay. So if there aren't any questions, uh, you know, it's something to to ponder and, and certainly it may generate more questions and I can answer those or I can get the answers from uh, from Kate or Maureen. Okay, and, and Maureen and Kate, thank you for coming in and presenting that tonight. That was um, very informative. Um, and, and then Dr. Dutch, from your perspective, is this something that would come up as a agenda item in the near future? Like, how do you see this progressing out? Yeah, we, we'd like to, if we were going to roll this out to the, the faculty, we, we'd like to try to do so in January so they would have sufficient time to understand the impact for them and to make a decision. Um, and we, that way we could make sure that we had everything in place for June, June 30th of 22. So yes, it would, you know, we'd like to like to see it on the agenda uh, as as something that you'd vote upon participating in uh, if that was the direction you chose to go uh, in December, no, late November, early December. Okay. No, I think I just want to make sure that the committee was aware so they could do any research or you know, ask any questions that they might have. Um, are there any other questions for Dr. Dutch from his presentation or report? Well, thank you, um, all three of you, for the presentation tonight. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Uh, and next up on the agenda is an update from uh, Mr. Adam.
All right, folks, we love what we do. And so I know we get close to time, so time's of the essence. And so I'll get right to it and jump right into it. This is something that I put together, give you an update of, of what we've been up to. This is uh, where we are and what we're going to end up back. So first, let me just jump into our extended pledge a little bit. We are Citrus Republic Schools, our home away from home, creating brilliant, brave, and beloved spaces in our house. This is our house. We reflect family, all families in all glory or not, vaccine or not, financing varied in its lot. Our skin is not a sin, it's the dressing of the blessing. We reflect education, sustained, motivated excellence in our hunger for knowledge, exploring new knowledge, beating the numbers and beyond the numbers. We science the math and our academic engineering. We reflect <clears throat> each other. We love how we love who we love, working on seeing the me and the we, equity and authenticity. We are the present, and that is the right now that was then before and again, and the, the future. We know tomorrow like it knew yesterday, refuting to be the doomed history that repeats itself. Folks, we are always we. We've got a lit, lit line, lit podcast, lit team, lit parental advisory. We are lit. We are unified by love, our house, inclusion, our family, and trust us. We are situ eight, four sets of four powerful words. This is our house, home away from home, always we, never me, scholars, family, and together. Folks, that's something I put together a little special to share with you all and know that the music that was accompanying the background, that comes from none other, one of our own very own eighth graders, Autumn Laverne, who shared that special piece and called it Tell Your Story. And tonight, what I'm going to do is give you an accelerated version of our story. So if you will allow me to, I'll share the screen and jump into something real quick. Um, and you can ask questions now or later. It just depends on what kind of time you have. You can always feel free to call me, email me, text me, etc. <clears throat> so here we go. Um, where you should see things right now. Okay. So uh, where we are right now um, is our update. Add a little bells and whistles to it. And um, we are SPS. I've been chanting this and shouting this as loud as we can anywhere we go. All of us are doing that. So I love the energy and the spirit that is happening with that. What I'll do is I've broken it down into three different categories as our journey continues. We're going to talk about it from the district level. We're going to talk about it from the, uh, the vantage point of students, faculty, and staff, and also of community, our community of uh, family and friends. I told you we love what we're doing. So here we go from the district level. Lit is serving as the foundation of everything, we do, everything we're doing when it comes to equity and when it comes to diversity and, and, <clears throat> and inclusion. And so this foundation is introduced through our pledge and through This Is Our House and everything that we're doing. And to further that foundation, I'm, I'm giving you a lot in a small, short period of time, we have added a lit committee to our official committees that are within the district. So when I say an official committee, it is that on the level of our curriculum committee, com cur curriculum committee, and our um, committee for professional development, et cetera, et cetera. And so this committee will have representation from each level of our district, and we'll work together to achieve um, four particular goals. Um, also, we started the year off with the SPS pledge. I want to give appreciation and show love to folks just embracing it and letting that be a guide and a part of our lit foundation. Every time you go into one of the, any of our schools in the district, you see this pledge and the students um, see it, they read it. It's also been made a part of morning announcements in a number of schools. And so it's been wonderfully absorbed and appreciated by the students. As I'm in the schools, I see some of the students just saying pieces of it as they pass by me as a greeting and as just a, a feeling of warmth. The other thing that we shout out uh, aloud is go SPS. If not introduced to you before, we, we break down the goal differently. We spell it G-O-E, which means greatest on earth, Citrus Public Schools, and that's what we're going for to be the best Citrus Public Schools on the planet. We continue our RIDES work, which stands, which is the, the program that we've been connected with, um, with Harvard and a number of other districts for almost a year now. And that's an acronym that stands for Reimagining Integration, Diverse, um, Equitable Schools. And so through that work, we have a number of initiatives that are coming through, including equity audits and different programs that engage in professional development for staff, faculty, administration, and students. 
And that's the, the next piece of the slide right here, the professional development opportunity. Something that's coming up and being introduced um, are professional development opportunities that just are ongoing. Not that only happen during half days and things like that, but we want to create a constant availability of professional development opportunities that folks can access as they wish. Um, the other thing that we've been up to is connecting with a lot of other districts. For some reason, um, all the work that folks are doing has been traveling to other places. And so we have a pretty good energy and enthusiasm and trajectory of positivity going on with this work that we're doing right now. Make no mistake, we have a lot of work to do, but what we're doing is getting known and getting shared out there. So all of you folks that are talking about what we're doing, it's appreciated. Let's continue to do that. And this next that and this next uh, perspective of students, faculty and staff. Let's talk about this is our house. But what I want to do is show you something a little different to give you an idea of what that thing is. So I got to stop sharing and then share a different screen um, so that you can see what it is. So. Here we go. And I want you to take a second and check this out. <clears throat> everything is produced and designed all that we it's everything everything is we so i'll stop that and then i will share the screen again i <laughs> see the clap and thank you appreciate that <laughs> um so here we go we're back here so the um this is our house this is the energy from that the engagement to of the community um is Nothing that can really be described in a short period of time, but I just have to mention it. I also want to share that the speeches that the students gave was just incredible. At some point, we want to try to figure out how we can share those with everyone because these students spoke from their hearts and spent time creating language that defies, that defines how they feel about the school, how they feel about this work and these efforts and how we are all connected. It was just simply beautiful. The art that folks created on the spot and in spontaneous inspiration based on the energy of This Is Our House was just incredible as well. As you go into the different schools, you'll see the art being displayed by, um, by the school. So I appreciate the art teachers that helped out, well, the art educators and all the faculty, staff, the principals, everybody making this thing happen. As you pr probably hear your students come home, they, they talk about This Is Our House because it's been made and a part of the, the, the foundation again of everything that's happening in the school. So um, that's, that's just really appreciated. The affirmation cards um, continue to be something that folks share with each other, and it's just been wonderfully received. I, I can talk more about that, but I'll just keep it short. Again, I continue to get emails from parents about the response to This Is Our House. Students continue to share feedback on it, and also classes have done some things to just say thank you and to further um, envelop the energy that comes from This Is Our House. Um, one of the new things that we're getting into is trying to create and working with some parents and some students to create something that's a, um, even a more neurodiversity friendly uh, version of This Is Our House. And again, uh, to that effect, it was really awesome to be able to create, set, create something and a version of This Is Our House for the ECC community as well. In each school, there's a lit team. I know I'm just running through these things, but again, timing. Uh, the lit teams, as of last week, all the teams were contacted. And so we began meeting this week to create them. And so the students will meet with the faculty and staff first, members of the teams, and then we'll pull the students in. So I believe by the end of this month, which in the next two weeks or the first week of November, we will have our uh, teams meeting. The lit teams have three specific goals that we're going to work through. One is to just engage and have a good time doing this work. Two is to work on uh, dining services initiatives that I work with uh, Steve, Steve, with um, David Stevens on where we're gonna add a little more culture to our cuisine, but we're gonna do it through the lit teams and it'll be customized to um, each 
uh, each school and particularly it, whatever the students decide the countries um, they want to highlight, maybe that becomes the menu for that um, for that month. The other piece to the lit team, the third thing that folks are going to work on is an MLK Memorial inclusion piece because I'm in, well, we're in the throes of continuing to develop uh, situates in our district's first MLK Memorial. And um, it's shaping out to be pretty fantastic thus far already. Um, I don't want to give away what's already being put in place, but it will be at the PAP and it will be on the day. And I hope that everyone can make it and that these things become annual events in our district. Um, as I spend one day respectively at each school weekly, it's been fantastic. The reception of me being involved in classrooms and in the community and in morning announcements, which have been really fun, particularly when I had to talk about the Red Sox winning and I'm a Yankee fan. It was very interesting to do that, but <laughs> uh, it's just been really fantastic how um, that my energy and our energy has been combined together to provide uh, an additional um, academic experience for our students. I spoke a little bit about the Dying Services already, the SPS Athletics piece, and continue to work with Scott Payne on that. And we have an upcoming um, meeting with the coaches that myself and Jen Lopes will be present at. In fact, that's this Thursday. And so we'll be working together with those people. I'm taking much more time than I wanted to. Um, let's see. The next thing, just reminding that we're all in together, always, we never meet. Regarding the lens of our community of family and friends, we have started the Lit Line, which is a number that you can dial. And when you dial it, you'll have a message that's dedicated to love, inclusion, and trust. It started out with a message from Muhammad Ali, then it went to honor Hispanic Heritage Month, which was last month, and it's currently uh, paying homage to Filipino Her Heritage Month. So. In that vein, happy Filipino Heritage Month to folks. Uh, the Lit Podcast actually has begun. And there's a, uh, it was previewed by a couple of people last week, but as soon as we're done here, I wanted to share it here first. I'll put it out officially so that folks can check that out. And every two weeks, there'll be a new segment of the podcast for folks to appreciate. This, this and the Lit Line uh, will involve uh, our family of, uh, family of, students, staff, faculty, friends, community, and folks like that. Um, the Lit Line can be done by an individual or by a group. The podcast can be anchored by myself, or we may have guest anchors, but with guests, that may include some of you on the screen at some point in time, or groups of people. The Lit Pack is the Love, Inclusion, Trust, Parental, Parental Advisory Group, and we've got a great reception to that. And at this point, we have 10 uh, parents that have made it known they want to be a part of this. And so we're going to email those folks and get started with the parental advisory group. The Freedom Team is, um, we're in the very end stages of its development. We have uh, students, we have parents, we have community members, we have the chief of police, we have uh, the, the uh, town administrator that's part of it as well. We are connecting with folks from the clergy um, and we also get in the clinician that does uh, trauma-informed training and so these are just different parts of what makes a freedom team work and so i would like to say that um, by the month of november we will have our first uh, official meeting and we will come um, official and we'll get the web page going and the, the hotline happening um the other thing that i'm working on currently is trying to get the different dei groups in situate together and i reached out to uh, three groups uh, to start this, and then it'll branch out to a lot or a lot larger. The three groups are going to be Citra Pride, Stride, and um, I'm forgetting um, Citra Pride, Stride, and oh, and SDEIC family. And so, folks have responded, and we'll begin to we're in the process of setting up a meeting where a representative from each of those groups will be present, and then from that we will uh, grow it out. Next, um, let's see. This is the DEI, DEI page. So um, let me share with that is, I wanna thank, um, can folks see that? Can you see the page right there? Can you shake your hands? Can you see that? I wanna give a, a huge sailor shout out to Emily Matthews, who's been tire tirelessly putting some work into bringing the DEI page to life and just taking whatever I'm sharing with her and just making it uh, a reality. So we're in the beginning stages of it, but it's coming. Um, so, um, here, well, you have the, about the director page where, where most of the content is, but then with their active goals, I can share that with folks, oh, come on computer. Right now, the active goals that are happening, 
affirm our commitment to DEI with excitement and good energy, foundation and community organization for students, staff, community as connected to DEI. That's where you get all the lit pieces there. And then share equitable processes and practices to address issues of bias. Those are going to come through um, that piece. Number three is going to come through our lit committee. And then as you go to the other piece of it, these are all the little pieces uh, that I mentioned to you before in that podcast, the SPS lit line, the pledge, the affirmation cards. Um, this is our house of some information there. The Champions Creed is something that was shared at the uh, welcome night at, for athletics. And I just wanted to make sure that that was present for it. For those who don't have the number for the lit line, there you go. That's the number, 781-545-8759. Two three three zero two. All right. Again, so it's our basic number, but then the extension is two three three zero two. If you do it in such a way that you uh, put a comma after the general number and then put the extension, it should just dial straight through for you. All right. Um, I'll come back to the presentation, and with that, just want to um, say thank you to folks, and I'll stop screen sharing. And I apologize for the quick run through of all of that because there's so much more to it, but that's where we are right now. And that was 16 minutes too long. Sorry about that, but there you go. Because I, I hated to run through it like that. Well, Jamil, there's no time limit on our meeting. So, you know, I always don't thought feel it was like you have to rest certain Oh, my fault. I always thought it was the end of eight o'clock. I mean, I could have took another <laughs> 20 minutes. All right, sorry about that. I didn't, I oh, really, I thought it was always the goal was to try to end the eight. Apologies for that, okay. I figured you were excited for the Red Sox starting in 10 minutes. <laughs> um, but no, thank you for that presentation. And I mean, as you saw at the first, you know, a couple items in our agenda is always celebrating student success, getting students in. So, I mean, if, you know, in the future, if it ever makes sense to bring students in to share some of the, the work they're doing, you know, it, it's always something great that we can, it, anytime we can share what our students are doing, what they're excited about is a great way to kick off our meeting and, and show where we're going as a district. Mm -hmm. okay. If there are any questions, let me know. I appreciate the hearts and the reactions from folks. Uh, people, we I feel we're really into this, and it, and the energy is is infectious and in a good way, and positive. So let's continue. I've heard nothing but great things about the work you've done in the classrooms with our, with, the, with the students, and you know just going to the different schools. Yeah, I always would say it's we. It's always, always. It's all of us working together. Every time, every every bit of this. I'll open up to the committee if they have any questions for Jamil. I don't. I don't have any questions. Just a general comment, uh, Jamil. I mean, this. It just makes me so proud of the work that you're doing that we decided to move forward with, with uh, with opening up this position and, and bringing you in. I mean, this is really important work that isn't measured in MCAS scores and that sort of stuff. Doesn't in you know doesn't get involved in in how our schools rank, but this is the work that's really important. Uh, I can't thank you enough for doing this. I feel like a lot of this stuff, you know, just doesn't get done or, you know, needed to get done here. And now it is. Um, and I'm sure that every district could benefit by having someone such as you um, and focusing on this type of work. But we're glad we have you and um, keep up the good work. I'm glad we have each other. Appreciate it. Thank you. I agree with what Peter said too, of course. And I would even say, honestly, like it does, I mean, maybe not MCAS, whatever, but it does translate to output and how children perform on any assignment or assessment because it's tied to inclusion and feeling comfortable and safe and, you know, able to learn and access curriculum. And so that will translate into numbers and grades and things like that. So I think it's all connected and it's awesome. And it just kind of, um, couldn't be more timely with the need for, um, you know, belonging and um, mental health and everything and pandemic related. So it's really just amazing work. So I'm really glad that Situate has you and the team to, um, you know, get this all continuing to just kind of take it to the next level. It's wonderful. And again, we have each other. This has been, it really is fantastic. I can't, I can't put everything into this, this short presentation, but there have been so many times where teachers and students and myself have had incredible moments. Um, and it, and I just, I'm just appreciative of how we are working together on it. I really haven't run into any um, hurdles. And when there are things that we need to address, which there are, we address them and when we get at them. So 
you know, we'll have some of those reports at some point as well, I'm sure. Yeah, I was going to say, I would just echo what um, Mr. Gates and Ms. Brandolini said and say that I know, Ms. Driscoll, you have your hands full with, with cleaning and collecting data. I do think that at some point it would be great. There's lots of good, validated, and reliable tools out there to measure all of what you're doing, um, Mr. Adams. And so I think we should be tracking that and celebrating not just the work, but also the, the outcomes that we're seeing as well. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. And all of this that we're doing now is going to be really helpful when we get additional information. So we know each other really well and where our hearts and heads are, and we can get into it even deeper with honesty and transparency. You know? Yeah. Um, I, I want to make a comment about, um, you know, last week was homecoming week, and I, I feel like there was just like a different energy, you know, at the high school. And I can't help but, you know, you, you, you did your This Is Our House um, presentation and rally with the kids. And, you know, that, that must have had some effect because I did, there was just, it was almost like normal <laughs> and better than normal, I want to say. <laughs> just, um, you know, all, all the different the, the activities they had for the kids. I just feel like there was an excitement. So I think your, your initial presentation at the beginning of the year was a nice, like, uh, springboard, you know, into what the school year could be like. <laughs> awesome. It's just complimenting what everybody's doing. <laughs> well, I, I yeah. can't stress that enough. Really, that's what yeah. it is. Um, two quick little stories. One is that I had a parent email me two weeks ago to ask if they can get another affirmation card. Um, and she said she needed another affirmation card because she had mistakenly thrown away the card that her daughter had. Now, the piece that was interesting was that she shared later on that her daughter had actually received the card from another student and her daughter was so just distraught that the card wasn't there. And so what we ended up doing, and I say we because I connected with Ann, this was in, in Gates, because I connected with Ann on how we can get not just the card, but we got a whole stack to the student. And it said, instead of just one, we give a whole stack, but the caveat is that she needs to share with everybody. And mom and student was super fantastic, um, happy about it. So that happened. Another one, that, another warm story is when I'm um, doing lunch um, uh, uh, at um, one of the schools and the, 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 the child that sees me is just excited. It looks up at me and says, wow, you're brown like my mom. And it was super excitement. And it was just a, a feeling at that moment that you could just tell that she just felt really, really just, just happy. And that there was someone that reflected her her parents at, at home, and there were a number of students that have um, similar reactions to that, and it, and it, and it's beautiful. I think it's just a great thing. Um, but those are just two quick stories I want to share that definitely have impact on you know how we're doing what we're doing. But those teachers right, are putting you. in work. Sorry, the teachers are putting in educators are putting in work, and the folks and all of you, everybody, we all doing this. Thank you all, Thank, and including the folks that feel differently and the work you're putting in there too we appreciate all of it yeah and those stories are great to hear from our perspective because you know that doesn't always come up to the school committee but it you know it gets to that little part of the community so anytime you know we're doing a presentation or something like that fits in feel free to jump in and you know share that throughout our meeting okay. hey we released that video probably in this week's Thursday thought. So other families, everybody will be able to see it. They'll be able to click on it. Yeah, Kim was putting hey, that. Sorry. <laughs> All right, is there any other uh, questions or comments in Jamil? All right, well, thank you for that presentation tonight. Uh, thank, thank you. And again, thanks to Kim and Joanne for pulling this off uh, with me. Thank you, everybody. I'll be quiet. And in that case, we'll move on in the agenda. Uh, the next item under new business is a memorandum, memorandum of understanding related to uh, COVID-19. Thank you, uh, Chairman Long. And I just wanted to give a, a shout out to all the presentations tonight. I thought they were informative and um, there's a lot of energy and excitement. I also want to let the community know to uh, certainly reach out to us if you have any questions or want to be involved in any of the good things happening. Um, as a major part of our you know, goal this year is to build relationships and connections with everybody. So I, I thank our team for their, their presentations tonight and sharing this uh, information with the district. The next couple of items are, you know, re related to our, for those that don't know what we're called memorandum, 
um, of understandings or MOUs. Uh, they're typically done with our unions, uh, discussed with our school committee uh, and executive session as they're happening and voted on by the specific unions involved. These happen to be with the Situate Teachers Associations, the first one. Um, before I get to that, I just want to thank um, the, both negotiation teams. I think the um, the negotiations were collaborative, were meaningful, and again, in year one of our leadership team, are the foundations of building strong relationships. Uh, these are very difficult conversations, and um, but coming to agreements are the are the happy part, the great part of our job. And so I want to give a shout out to our team. Um, you know, Bonnie Donahue, Bob Dutch, and Mike and Janice uh, of the school committee for all the hours and time you put in and appreciate your insight and support. Also want to thank um, Greg, uh, Nicole, and Eileen, the STA leadership team, and their team for all their hard work and efforts going above and beyond and having uh, respectful and uh, continuous dialogue. And again, building the foundation of that responsibility to come to these agreements that we're voting on tonight. The first one uh, is the COVID-19 safety related MOU, um, which is similar to one we uh, had last year. Uh, since we're still in a pandemic, we believed it was important that we were collaboratively to come up with some um, understandings about how we keep our students and staff safe in schools. Um, and so that's the one you'll be voting on. In that particular case, it was approved by the uh, STA uh, membership already and discussed with our team in executive session. Uh, so I look to the committee to see if there are any questions related to the first MOU that we have on the agenda tonight. If, if not, um, I will entertain a motion on the MOU. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the Situate Teachers Association Memorandum of Understanding for uh, COVID-19. Second. second. Thank you. We'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Brandolini? Yes. Kate? Yes. Simblon? Yes. Uh, Borkowski? Yes. And Long, yes. Uh, so the next item is the MOU on a one-year extension with the STA. Great, thank you. Um, this particular one, um, we have six unions, and uh, this one happens to be with the again the STA Sister Teachers Association. Uh, this one involves the COLA, which is the cost of living allowance uh, specifically, and the agreement would impact units A and B and stipend and positions um, in their salary for this year only and again this was discussed in executive session and voted on and approved by the teachers association are there any questions on this are you not i'll entertain a motion um, on the mra uh, i'll make a motion to approve the situ teachers association memorandum of understanding one-year extension salary schedule Is there a second? A second. Thank you. Uh, so we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Lindblom? Yes. Borkowski? Yes. Long, yes. Brandolini? Yes. And Gates? Yes. Thank you all. Um, and then the last item related to the MOU that we discussed tonight is a uh, proposed change to the 2021-2022 school calendar. Is this also, as you said, uh, Chairman Long, is it um, reflected in the negotiation process? And what uh, this would spell out would be that the um, the March 18th Professional Development Day um, would um, be canceled and would now become a full day of school for students and place the December 23rd day um, would be a day off for students and teachers. So we're basically flipping the 18th with the 23rd. In effect, the 18th will be a full day now. On your calendars, it currently shows up as a professional development day. Um, that will be a full day. And where the 23rd of December on your current, current calendars shows a day of school, that will be a day off for um, students and teachers. 
Are there any questions from the committee on this? Okay, uh, Superintendent Burke, I just had one. Um, so obviously, you know, the, the original calendar came out what, six months ago now. Um, families do, you know, make plans related to that calendar. So if, you know, a family did have plans to take March 18th for whatever reason, whether, you know, they're not going to be around, the kids wouldn't have the ability to come to school. Is that something that they can work with the their school to have, make sure it's an excused absence and not, you know, negatively impact whatever the family's planned? Yeah, 100% we work with them. We don't like changing the calendar, certainly, and we know people go by it. Uh, we're hoping uh, to planning actually to get this change pending tonight's vote um, out in the Thursday thoughts and other um, up on our, our website so that people have ample time to make any adjustments. So we'll specifically um, let our community know that there's been a change and then we'll work individually with um, any families or students that have uh, a conflict because of the change, certainly. Yeah, yeah. I just want to make sure that's clear for families because we've had that issue in the past and you know it became ambiguous and a lot of questions. So just making sure it's clear in the Thursday thoughts whenever this goes out to the community. Um, yeah, just make it a easier transition for them in their calendars. Great, thank you. Will do. Um, any, so if there's no other questions on the proposed change, I will entertain a motion on um, that item. I'll make a motion to cancel the professional development day on March 18th, making 18th a full day of school for all students and staff, and to make December 23rd, 2021, a no school day for students and teachers. I'll second. Is there a roll call vote? Uh, Long, yes. Gates? Yes. Brandolini? Yes. Limbon? Yes. And Borkowski? Yes. Uh, thank you, Superintendent Burkhead, for uh, presenting those. And, and similar to what you said at the beginning of this, I do want to thank um, the SBA um, and our negotiation team throughout the entire process. We're having a very professional and um, strong relationship as we move forward through this, um, closed it out, and you know, obviously got this approved by both the union and the school committee tonight. So thank you to all involved. Thank you, Mr. Wong. And I also would I'd like to give a shout out to the other five unions, unions as well who um, have also negotiated in good faith and um, just really proud of the work everyone's done together. So I'd like to thank all six unions for their work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the next item on our agenda is the liaison appointment vacancies. So obviously um, having Michael Hayes resign from the school committee and Dr. Borkowski coming on, uh, we do have to finagle our um, current uh, liaison and subcommittee position. So I'm going to uh, share my screen. Let's see if you can all see this. Uh, with just a list of all of the subcommittee uh, positions that we have, as well as the school councils. Um, based on the feedback that I got from the committee, um, just ahead of this, I know you know one item that's out there is a school building committee. Uh, Janice said said that she might you know want to come off of this. I think this year, the biggest um, work on that will be one or two meetings potentially at the end of the year before the next um, town election and we reorganize again. Um, and then Ms. Brindolini had brought up that um, she is the current liaison for the Jenkins School Council, but based on the timing of their meetings, um, she could be looking to move off of that. Um, Mike, um, yep. I think I said the school building committee was the one that I wanted to stay on. Is that what you said? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I thought sorry. I thought you said stay off. So I, I might have no, got it wrong in my notes. Okay. I'll take that back. I know uh, Peter had shown interest in that um, as well. So. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Dr. Borkowski, before we make any votes on this, is, are there any? You, know, you and I talked about this briefly earlier. Too, are there any of the uh, liaison positions that you would not want to take on and replace Mr. Hazel? I'm going to be flexible, Mike. And if, um, I mean, if Peter wants to be on the school building, I mean, he could, you know, we could consider that. Like, I don't have to be on that one. Uh, Peter, is that one that you were still interested in? 
Yeah, I was just trying to take a little bit of burden off of uh, care, and it's it's. Um, yeah, I, I have interest in doing it for sure. And as you indicated, it's not a heavy lift this year. Um, I think that it would tend, depending upon how things proceeded our special town meeting, it could potentially become a heavy lift in years to come. So I, I would be interested in, in joining that for sure. Okay, that's fine. Yep. Um, and then Dr. Burkowski, would you want to replace Mike on the Hadley School Council? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, and then is there anyone interested in, um, Nicole, I know that this is the only school council position that you have. Is there anyone that would want to take on the Jenkins um, school council? I think they typically meet around 3.45, 4 o'clock, so right after school. Um, yeah, that's kind of the issue is I'm not, I can't, um, I just can't make it with my work schedule. So I'd be willing to swap with someone or if anybody wants to inherit it, I know they would love to have representation there from our committee. Um, Mike, did um, were you, did somebody from Wampatec reach out to you? Uh, not yet, no. Okay, because they reached out to me, but I think because I was last year, so I thought it was this year, but I can do Jenkins if you 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 plan on doing Wampatecs. Um, so Nicole, if you wanted Wampa talk, I, I could switch with you. I know I, I have Gates and obviously I don't want to leave you out. Okay. Do we know what time Wampa talk meets? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think all the elementary schools are generally I know, like close I know. to dismissal. Like, yeah, it's yeah. super hard for me to hit those because of, yeah, I'm out of I'm leaving my own school at that time. <laughs> um, but I mean, I was gonna, I might be able to do like dial in even. Oh. Okay, so if, so if you want, Nicole, I, I can have you, I can switch with you and you can take on Wampatuck. So I'll make okay. sure that their principal is aware. And okay. then if there's a if there's a conflict or you can't make it for whatever reason, we can, uh, we can look at this again. All right. Okay, um, so what I'm hearing then is with the exception of Mr. Gates taking on the school building committee, um, and Ms. Limblom taking on Jenkins and Ms. Brandolini taking on um, Wampatuck, all of the positions that Mike Hayes previously held would be taken on by um, Dr. Borkowski. Yeah, Mike, can you just go over, I mean, this is just for clarification for, I guess, for you and for, um, Carrie is the capital planning committee. So as we know that we only get one vote there, but the reason that I think last year, two years ago, it made sense to add two folks because it's a pretty, um, has been a pretty substantial commit. Um, I just want to make sure that you and, and Carrie understand that though you're both on the committee, there's only one vote on that. We just want to make sure that at least one person goes to each meeting. Yep, and, and what I can do, Carrie, is I can I can work with you to make sure that um, I think when we voted this initially, I was considered the voting member, but I can I can work with you throughout the capital planning meetings um, for the next time meeting or any meetings they have between now and then. Okay, sounds great. Um, so if there are no other questions or. Uh, request to change, I'll entertain a motion to um, update our liaison and um, subcommittee position. So do we have to vote on each one that is changing? No, I think you can just move it based on the um, explanation that I gave a minute ago. Okay. Well, I, have, I, I, I just want to Ask one thing, uh, N Nicole, are we the B happies? I didn't see that on the <laughs> thing, or is it going to be? I think we're on there. We are? I didn't. Let me okay. double check. Yeah. Uh, so Nicole, Nicole and my case were listed as the two. Oh, okay. Uh, school committee members. I, I know in our last meeting, Jamil, you had mentioned that you were, you were on that from the 
school perspective. Yeah. That obviously wouldn't change as part of this. Yeah. All right, so should I make a motion? <laughs> Sorry, I, my kids were screaming. I couldn't even hear you. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> I was going to say, did you just ask me a question? Because if you did, I didn't hear it. <laughs> but if Janice is going to make a motion, let's just move forward. Um, so I make a mo motion to uh, approve the liaison uh, positions as presented and discussed. Yeah, that works. <laughs> is there a second? I'll okay. second it. No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Who's on first? <laughs> All right, uh, so we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Gates? Yes. Brandolini? Yes. Long, yes. Uh, Borkowski? Yes. And Limbaugh? Yes. Uh, so, Bill, I'll make I'll send an email to Kim just updating her on all of the um, liaison positions either tonight or tomorrow morning. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, so next on the agenda is the first and only opportunity for public comment. Um, if people want to uh, make a comment at this time, they can raise their hand on the um, through the Zoom, and I, I can ask them to unmute. Okay. Uh, Ms. Rama Posha. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm call I'm I'd like to just um, say that the high school dance that happened on Saturday, the homecoming dance, um, I was excited to see um, that it was really well attended. And I was hoping that this could become something more regular. Um, I think that the more dances there are, the better kids are at going to them and they enjoy them more. Um, so I don't know if there's some kind of initiative that can be undertaken. I think that the um, This Is Our House celebrations at the schools have really um, been working and bringing people together. So I think that is probably what led to the higher attendance at this dance than we've seen in recent years. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up as and I, I don't know who would have to spearhead that at the high school level. I don't know if there's like an active PTO, but um, the kids there was like, I think it was like freshmen or sophomores that, that were in charge of like organizing it. So there were, you know, a few complaints that they, some people didn't like the music or whatever, but overall it, you know, the kids had a good time. And if this could be something that's more formally organized with really good DJ and maybe a little concession stand or something, I think this would do a lot to improve the morale at schools. And I apologize, do you mind just setting your address or um, school affiliation as well? Oh, yes. Um, I'm at 121 Sedgwick and um, my school affiliation is high school, middle school, and uh, Hatterley. Okay. Sorry, I forgot to mention that at the beginning of the public comment. Um, but no, thank you for your comment. We can we can definitely take that away. Uh, so seeing no other um, people requesting public comment, I'll move on in the agenda. Uh, the next item is the approval of minutes. So we have the, uh, the October 4th, 2021 school committee minutes. So unless anyone has any changes or questions on those, I will entertain a motion to approve them. Anybody? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of October 4th, 2021. I'll second. <laughs> uh, okay, Lindblom? Yes. Borkowski? Yes. Uh, Long, yes. Uh, Gates? Yes. 
and Brandolini. Uh, I will abstain. Okay. Uh, to the next on the agenda under correspondence, we have uh, the minutes from the South Shore Educational Collaborative. Uh, Superintendent Burkhead, was there anything that you wanted to, to bring up regarding those? Yes, just that I attended that meeting in person and it was uh, basically an update on the, um, the budget. Their budget for FY21 was uh, a net positive, which is always a good thing. And their budget for this year we voted to approve is also the director's uh, contract. And finally, um, I guess their need right now is for students um, to, as they get money for incoming students to allow to pay for their staffing for the budget this year is the only concern at the time that the collaborative is having. So um, it's a little summary of that meeting. It was in person. It was great to see all of the uh, surrounding superintendents and um, to visit the collaborative. Great, thank you for that. Uh, are there yeah. any questions for Superintendent Burkett? Uh, there are none, then moving on, we did have one warrant in the backup. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Dutch. Thank you. Um, I've actually got two warrants, so you may not have the backup for the other, uh, but I'll go through them both. And uh, if there's questions, I'll be happy to answer them. The first warrant is S211007, total of $134,439.44. Um, through grant funds, we spent $15,675 from the METCO grant. Uh, within our local budget uh, for contracted services heat, $23,583.57. That was for two expansion tanks to be replaced at the high school. Uh, for contract services other, we paid $13,372.42 to BCM controls uh, for security camera work. Um, under math supply, we paid $6,395.40 for advanced placement textbooks. And those are our only significant expenses there. And that warrant was signed by Mr. Gates. Second warrant is S. 211014, total of $172,129.27. Uh, significant expenditures there, private school tuition, $63,896.80. Uh, collaborative tuition, $14,102.50. Our utilities to National Grid for electric service, $48,380.66. Just as a point of reference, uh, we've I've begun to explore uh, a solar um, power purchase uh, through a collaborative group to look at a, a way to decrease our costs and also decrease our carbon footprint. Uh, and those were the only significant uh, large ticket items on that. A particular warrant. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dutch. Are there any questions from the committee on the two warrants? Uh, is there any um, is there any other business that members of the committee wanted to bring up in tonight's meeting? Okay, seeing none. Uh, so a couple upcoming future agenda items. So celebrate student learning at our November 1st meeting will be related to the fine arts. Um, we'll have an update on the October 1st enrollment in our school district, um, an update from the MAC and you know, related to our masking policy based on uh, whatever comes out from the commission over the next week and a half. And then, you know, Superintendent Burke has said that in his leadership report, uh, town meeting is 1026. Um, obviously we're looking for support from the town on the feasibility study for Hazley and Christian. Uh, so we do hope everyone comes out and votes to um, approve that article when we get there. Mike, I just have one comment. Um, 
I listened to um, the town weekly update with the uh, superintendent and uh, there was mentioned that, that they were recommending masks at town meeting, but what is going to be the policy? Superintendent, do you happen to know? So I actually talked to Karen Connolly next last week regarding that. Um, they're strongly recommending masks. They mentioned that um, they have, you know, there could be a potential voting rights issue if someone tries to come to the meeting and then has to leave because they're not wearing a mask. Uh, so I um, did reiterate what our policy is just so that they're aware. Um, but, you know, the town is working, I know, through the town administrator, and I believe their legal counsel to make a, a recommendation to masks as opposed to um, necessarily mandating them. And that was right. as of last week. I believe they're going to, that's actually on their agenda uh, for tomorrow night. Report okay. a meeting. Great. Oh, thanks for the clarification. I just happened to hear that, and I was, I was just curious the background. So that help, that helps a lot. Okay. So yeah, I'd reach out just to make sure they were aware of. So can I ask a follow up to that? Um, because you know our our policy is that masks need to be wear, worn in school buildings, and it is a school building. I mean, couldn't we just have masks available for those that show up without them? Um, I'll, I'll I mean, reiterate that I can read, I can bring that up with Karen again. Yeah. Uh, is that a tomorrow? I, mean, I, I did let them know that that was the case, and I know the town was working on um, an approach on um, town meeting, but I, I we, did send them. We the required masks for the last. That's silly. We required masks at the last couple at the last town meeting, so I'm not sure why they're saying it's right. different this time. And it, and it is school. Yeah. It's a school building. Correct. No, I know. that was reinforced with the board of select or yeah. with their chair. Okay. Uh, so if there's nothing else from the committee, um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn at 827. So moved. A second. Uh, long yes, Gates. Yes. Brendalini. Yes. Limblom? Yes. And Borkowski? Yes. Done. Right. Thank you, everybody. Have a um, great rest of your night. All right. Thank, Thank you. you.